Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the University of Michigan Department of Physics and by gifts from friends of the program. Local broadcast is made possible by Pfizer Incorporated. This is the beginning of a lecture series on how everything in the universe came to be. And what I'm going to do today is give you a um, broad general outline of how this works. In some sense, the grandest of all questions that one can ask is, how did we get here? And what I'll try to do or outline for you today is how that is and how the laws of physics play um, an, inter an integral role in making that happen. There are four basic forces of nature that um, drive the formation of absolutely everything in the universe. And let me just remind you what they are. The first is gravity, and um, you're all familiar with gravity, and gravity does what you think it does. There's electromagnetism. You've heard of the electric force and also probably magnetic forces. When you do physics, it turns out that the two kinds of forces are really one and the same, and we talk about the electromagnetic force. So the electromagnetic force just counts as one of the four forces, not two. In addition, there's two slightly less obvious forces called the strong and weak force. The strong force is the strong is the force that holds nuclei together. You probably know that nuclei contain protons and neutrons and that like charges repel. So if the positive charges in nuclei are to be held together, some force has to hold them together. And that's the strong force. Physicists thought really hard and decided, well, what should we call this? And since it's stronger than the electric force, they decided they would call it the strong force. And, <laughs> and that turns out to play an important role in how everything came to be as well. And then there's an even more mysterious nuclear force called the weak force. The weak force plays a role in determining the um, abundance of one component of matter called dark matter. It also plays an important role in turning different elements into each other. And it acts also on the nuclear scale, like the strong force, but it's not as strong. So again, physicists thought really hard about it, and they decided to call it the weak force. Now, in addition to these four forces, they have three different stages upon which to play. Back in the 19th century, we had what is called classical physics. This is the physics that is really the physics of everyday existence, the physics that you see throwing baseballs around and watching them fall and those kinds of things are all belong to the realm of classical physics, as well as classical electricity and related phenomena. Now, in the 20th century, beginning around about 100 years ago, this picture of physics was generalized in three important ways. And all three of these important generalizations turn out to be crucial for understanding how our universe came to be. And we'll only have time today to highlight very briefly how each of these different generalizations play a role, but as you'll see during the course of this timeline that I'm about to present, they do, in fact. And the generalizations are first quantum mechanics. When you go from everyday scales down to tiny scales, the scales of atoms notably, then particles don't act like particles anymore, they act like waves. And this wave nature is crucial for understanding what happens on the atomic scale. And it introduces a probabilistic description into how nature works. On the other hand, there's another generalization which happens when we go from everyday scales to very large scales, like the scale of the universe itself. When you get to such large scales, masses can play a role, and speeds can become comparable to the speed of light. And then relativity starts to play a role, and relativity changes our description of what happens on speeds that are very fast and on mass scales that are very large or very dense. It turns out the entire universe itself is driven by the laws of general relativity. And then in between those, there's a third phenomena which you're actually very familiar with, and that's chaos theory. Namely that many systems are so complex that a little tiny difference in its condition today can lead to a very big difference a day later or a week later. This is exactly why the weather is such a problem. Every time you read a weather report, they make a prediction for the next day, which is pretty good. 
and a prediction for two days after that, which is okay, and a prediction for three days down the line, which sometimes is right. And even though, and I'm not sure why they do this, they make predictions for a week in advance, they're never right. <laughs> And it's not that these guys don't know what they're doing. They, of course, do. The point is that little changes in the weather today lead to big changes in the weather a week later. And the time scale for this is very roughly a week. You can't make predictions in day-to-day -day weather more than a week in advance. You're just dead in the water because of chaos. So all three of these generalizations of our 19th century concept of physics add up to give us our universe. So one of the nice things that's happened just in the last couple of years is that all of these pieces have come together and we can now give you a consistent timeline and story of our universe's birth from the Big Bang itself to today. And then at the very end of this lecture series, I'll even come back and tell you how it all dies in the end, <laughs> which is a very cheery thought. Now, let's go to the beginning. So in the beginning, what was there? One of the numbers that I'd like you to keep in mind is that we now have a relatively well-defined age for the universe. The universe is about 14 billion years old. Now, we've advanced to the point where we think we can do better than saying about 14. We really think the universe is 13.7 billion years old. And we are getting to the point in our understanding where we worry about the difference between 13.7 and 14. That's also about the relative error of what we know what we're talking about. Okay, so you can ask a sensible question, well, if the universe is only 14 billion years old, what was going on 15 billion years ago? Before there was a universe, there must have been something, right? And unfortunately, I don't have a good answer for you, but that won't stop me from giving you an answer. Um, <laughs> before there was a universe, there was, are you ready for this? There was a high energy manifold of space time Oops, we lost our universe. And <laughs> this high energy manifold of space time has energy scales so high that both quantum mechanics and relativity and probably chaos all have to be folded into the description, the description of the universe at the same time. So you have this foamy space time. And what that means is that time itself is not really defined. You can't slice time any finer than intervals of about 10 to the minus 43 seconds. So out of this background, which I've drawn here, I guess I don't have a pointer, but I've drawn as the wavy background on the base of that, there was a manifold of space-time that just fluctuated around. Then every once in a while, a little patch of that space-time gets itself into the right configuration. Ah, thank you. Warren is great. Um, so this is the universe before there was a universe. It's a high energy space time at the Planck scale, which means the energy scale of 10 to the 19 GeV or so. And it means that every 10 to the minus 43 seconds, the geometry changes, okay? So there's little fluctuations every 10 to the minus 43 seconds in this background that every once in a while this little patch decides to get itself into the right configuration so it can launch itself onto a longer lived trajectory. Now, you might find that description a little vague. And it is. Um, if I had a better explanation, then I would be back in my office writing a paper on this. Um, we, don't, we haven't quite identified exactly what the mechanism is that launches a universe into existence out of the space time. There's been a lot of work done on it. And string theory, which is one way to combine gravity and quantum mechanics together, will hopefully eventually lead us to a clear answer on this. In the meantime, I can only be vague. But what we do know is that after 10 to the minus 43 seconds and after this birth event where the universe is launched onto this trajectory, we can tell the story of the universe from that moment, the 10 to the minus 43 second mark, on to today with ever increasing clarity as we go towards the present time. So during the first 10 to the minus 37 seconds or 35 seconds of the universe's existence, we think that the universe expanded really rapidly. This is an early phase called inflation. And what happens here is very roughly you have a little tiny patch of the universe. And it's tiny so that at this early time, everything inside that little tiny volume is the same. So the universe is nice and it's smooth. It has the same laws of physics. And everything is well defined. Then all of a sudden, over this tiny time scale, it blows itself up in volume to be enormously large. 
And then after that mark, the universe continues to expand rather slowly. Now the reason why we think this early phase of rapid expansion happened, which is called inflation, is that it automatically guarantees that the universe has many of the properties that we see today. First of all, it guarantees that it can live for a long time. It allows it to live for a long time. Instead of folding back into that messy chaos of um, foam that I showed in the earlier slide on a 10 to the minus 43 second time scale, it allows it to be big enough to expand for the 13.7 billion years that we see. It also makes the universe very flat. If you take a balloon and you blow it up to be very large, the surface of the balloon becomes flat. Just think of our Earth. If you take a marble, you see that it's curved. If you blow it up to the size of the Earth, you can walk around on it and you see that it's flat. This inflationary epoch from here to here is akin to taking a marble and expanding it to about the size of the entire observable universe today, which is about 14 million light years. So it's much flatter than the Earth. So this, um, this epoch gives us a big universe, an old universe, and a flat universe, and a smooth universe. Because before the epoch of inflation, the universe was tiny, it was small enough that it could talk to all the different parts of itself, thereby making itself nice and smooth and homogeneous. And then once it expanded, it just got smoother. And that's a way to understand why it is that our universe has the remarkable properties of being homogeneous and isotropic that it does today. Now the next epoch that we'll talk about, oh, I should remark that there's a little scorecard in the bottom of each of my slides where we talk about the different forces and how they play a role. So the previous slide, which I forgot to tell you about, is really gravity versus gravity, because general relativistic gravity tells us the way in which the universe expands. Regular gravity and regular matter pulls it back together, but the way in which you get this accelerating universe, this inflationary universe, is to have a new kind of gravity or a new kind of matter in relativistic gravity theory that gives you an um, accelerating universe. And it's the interplay between these two, this gravity between gravity, or gravity fighting gravity, that gives you the inflationary epoch. So what happens next is that in these early times, there's actually no matter in the universe, which is kind of a problem. Now, when I say there's no matter, what it means is that there's actually equal amounts of matter and its evil twin, antimatter. Okay, so let's just do ourselves a little experiment. Touch the shoulder of the person next to you. Now, you notice that nobody exploded, right? <laughs> now, what this means is actually very profound. It means that the person next to you is, chances are, not made of antimatter. <laughs> In fact, you can do these kinds of experiments and you find that the entire room is filled with matter. When we landed on the moon, the Apollo astronauts didn't explode. And we really did land on the moon, by the way. Um, <laughs> so we're pretty sure that the moon is also composed of matter. Now, astronomers have done this experiment a little bit more indirectly all the way across the observable universe. And what we find is that all the galaxies, as much as we can tell, are actually made of matter and not antimatter. Now, it's possible to hide some antimatter somewhere in the universe, but any direct, uh, you know, positive detections have always been of matter, and there's lots of evidence for absence of antimatter. So the question is, how did this come to be? Well, what happened was that during the first microsecond, that's the time scale, during the first microsecond of the universe's existence, all of the matter was in the form of quarks. Quarks are the basic constituents that make up protons and neutrons. And there were, in the beginning, equal numbers of quarks and antiquarks. And during that first microsecond, there were out of equilibrium processes, which are still being studied, wherein the strong force, in combination with the weak force, fights against gravity and produces a small excess of, ant of regular quarks over antiquarks. Now, the excess is tiny. For every 30 million antiquarks, there were only 30 million and one quarks of ordinary matter. Now, once the universe gets old and cool enough, at about the microsecond mark, or 10 microsecond mark. The 30 million antiquarks annihilate with the 30 million quarks, leaving behind that one in 30 million, and then that one in 30 million with its friends combine to form the protons and neutrons that make up everything in the universe today. 
So after a few microseconds have, or tens of microseconds have passed, we have no more quarks and very little antimatter, only this tiny excess of regular matter left over. And that's the matter that makes up everything in the universe today. Um, all the galaxies, all the stars in the galaxies, all the planets, you and me. Now from the microsecond mark until about the one second mark, not much happens. But at the one second mark, it turns out there's another constituent of the universe that does something very important. Before the universe is about one second old, there are these dark matter particles. Now, we'll come back to this later, but one of the things that we've realized over the last couple decades is that most of the matter in the universe is not made of ordinary matter, where by ordinary matter I mean the protons and neutrons that we just talked about. Only about 4% of the universe by weight, as you'll see, is made in, up of protons and neutrons, and 30% of it, far more, is made up in, of these mysterious particles that are called dark matter particles. These are particles that don't interact through the strong force and the weak force that we met before. I mean, they don't act through the strong force and the electric force that we met before. They interact only through the weak force and gravity. So their abundance is set by the weak, the strength of the weak force. And the weak force is strong enough to keep these particles in equilibrium until the universe is the ripe old age of one second. And then after the universe is older than one second, the interactions among these dark matter particles cease, and we're left with whatever we're left with. And what we're left with is about 30% of the universe in the form of these dark matter particles. Now slightly thereafter, beginning right after these dark matter particles freeze out, that's why I'm showing you a picture of icicles, um, the protons and the neutrons finally start to do something. See, in the beginning there are no elements, there's only protons and neutrons. As we saw before that, there weren't even those, there were only quarks. But at the one second mark, there's only protons and neutrons. And what happens is that the protons and neutrons get together through the action of the strong force, which fights against the electric force, which tends to make the particles repel, and gravity, which is making the universe accelerate, thereby accelerating the particles away from each other. So the strong force has to win its battle against the electric force and gravity in order to make any elements. Now, during this early stage, only three elements of any import are made namely helium, deuterium, and lithium. All of the rest of the elements, as we'll talk about shortly, are made later on in stars. Now, you might wonder, why is this a big deal? Well, the reason why it's a big deal is that if you go out and look at the helium abundance in our universe, it's about 25%. Or, right, actually, right now it's a little bit bigger. It's 26 or 20, 27%. At the, and you can ask, well, how much energy is produced in this process? Remember that stars like our sun are powered by nuclear fusion reactions, wherein protons get together and they form helium nuclei. That's the basic power source for our sun. If we look out in the universe, hold that thought, and we look out in the universe and we see that 25% of the universe is in the form of helium, that's a lot of energy. When you do the accounting, that turns out to be more energy than, are, than can be possibly produced by all the stars in all the galaxies that have ever lived throughout the entire history of the universe. And not by just a little bit, but by a factor of 10 or so. So one of the reasons why we believe in this Big Bang picture, and my colleagues will tell you more of the detail further on in the lecture series, but one of the key reasons why we believe in this picture is that by doing the calculation of finding nuclear reactions at this early time, we can explain the abundance of helium and the other light elements that we see. And there's no other explanation for it. So even though helium is produced in stars, there are not enough stars to produce the amount of helium that we see. There's also that little problem of getting the helium out of the star <laughs> once you've made it, but we won't talk about that. So this epic of nucleosynthesis, as it calls, is as it's called, is one of the cornerstones of Big Bang Theory. And it occurs during this window that begins at about the one second mark and ends at about the three minute mark. Then nothing all that important happens for a little while. <laughs> From the three minute mark until about the 300,000 year mark, the universe expands rather peacefully. Now as it does so, <clears throat> it, contains, it contains both matter and electromagnetic radiation. And the electromagnetic radiation is dense enough that the different light particles can talk to each other 
and thereby reach a particular equilibrium form. That equilibrium form is called a black body. So if you look at that, um, or if you wait until the universe is about 300,000 years old or so, sorry, I'm getting feedback. If you wait until the universe is about 300,000 years old, then the universe becomes rarefied enough and, and um, less dense enough that the photons no longer interact with each other and they no longer interact with the matter as well. So whatever form the spectrum of radiation has at this point will freeze out and will still be with us today so we can see it. So this plot here shows the results of a satellite that flew in the late 80s and published this work in the early 90s where they measured the spectrum of the light coming from the background of the universe. It's called the cosmic microwave background. And what you can find is that it's precisely in a very particular equilibrium form, which meant that the radiation had to be produced under equilibrium conditions, which happens to be exactly what the Big Bang gives you, and there's no other way anyone's ever thought about to explain it. So this is another cornerstone of the Big Bang theory, namely that the background radiation has the right spectral form, and it has a particular temperature associated with it that we know to at least four decimal or four significant figures and perhaps more depending on how optimistic you are. Now, another thing that happens at this epoch is that I told you earlier the universe was smooth and homogeneous, and it is, but if you look on a fine enough scale, you see that it's not completely smooth. So, more recently, Another satellite called the WMAP satellite was able to map the background radiation to high accuracy. And what you see is that this thing in the middle is just a galaxy, which you have to ignore. But these hot, the cold spots are blue and the hot spots are red. You see that there's this pattern of hot and cold spots across the universe. That means the radiation in the universe is a little bit hotter and a little bit colder at different parts of the sky. Now the level of this is important, and it's very small. It's only about one part in 10 to the five. So if you were to plot this picture on an ordinary scale, you would just see it to be white, so it wouldn't be very interesting. So what, I've, what they do is they subtract out the background and just plot the relative difference between that. And you see this beautiful picture. Now this is, what this means is important because the reason why the radiation is a little bit hotter or a little bit colder is that when the universe last had its radiation interact with matter, the matter was a little bit denser and a little bit rare, more rarefied in different spots. So this picture, this map, represents the initial conditions for the formation of structure in the universe. The red spots are the parts that are just a little bit denser by a few parts in 10 to the 5 over the background. And those are the parts that will eventually collapse under gravity and form structures. So here's a simulation done by my colleague Gus Everard and his friends, which would look better if it were darker. But you can see, <laughs> this is a simulation of half of the universe, half of the observable universe today. And you see that um, if you start from the fluctuations that we showed you as measured in the earlier map, and let the universe evolve in a computer simulation towards today, you see all kinds of foamy structures start to come out of the background. Now, if you just stare at this picture, you kind of get an answer to the question. Um, there's sort of a, a, a question that comes up in these discussions, namely that the universe is supposed to be homogeneous and isotropic. It's supposed to be really smooth, right? On the other hand, when you look out in the sky, you see stars. And if you look out of the sky in big telescopes, you see galaxies. So when you look at the, the universe today, at the present time, with just optical light, it looks incredibly lumpy, right? You see these points of light and nothing in between, just darkness. And yet, the Big Bang Theory that we keep selling you says, well, the universe is supposed to be incredibly smooth, right? So the question that you should ask yourself is, how is it that the universe can be so completely lumpy when we look at it and so completely smooth when we tell you about it? And the answer is really right here in Gus's picture that it's both. If you look on a large enough scale, and here we're looking at half the universe at once, and you kind of blur your eyes a little bit because it's morning, you see that it is really smooth, right? But if you zoom in and you look very closely, then you see that there are lumps. 
So there's a nice progression from the previous picture of little lumps growing into large scale structures of more well defined lumps. And then those lumps themselves collapse into galaxies. And here's a Hubble Space Telescope picture of um, real galaxies. And we can zoom in even further and see even denser clusters of galaxies. And we now have a theory which tells us how the force of gravity fighting against the expansion of the universe can produce all of these structures from the very large structures here all the way down to individual galaxies. I'm showing you a picture of Andromeda, which is the nearby galaxy, because I don't have a picture of our own, because we can't take a picture of our own unless we were to go out to Andromeda. So <laughs> this takes us up to um, the present location, namely our own galaxy. It also takes us up to the present times. So the one thing I want to remind you is that um, what um, astronomers and physicists have been doing over the last, doesn't like it when I stand there, um, what they've been doing over the last couple of decades is trying to pin down the properties of the galaxy or of the universe in as great a detail as possible. So what this plot shows are there's three main experiments. Um, and there's two main components to the universe, okay? First of all, let me define what one means, okay? The universe has a particular critical density. And the density is usually defined that if you have ordinary matter and the density is bigger than that critical density, then the universe is fat enough, it weighs enough, to bring itself to a halt and collapse in on itself in the future. That's called an overdense universe. An underdense universe is one in which the density is less than that critical density, in which case there's not enough mass and not enough gravity to keep the universe from expanding, and it just expands forever. And then there's a critical universe, one that's in between, where you have exactly that critical density. For ordinary matter, that universe will expand forever, but slow down as it does so. One of the things that's come up in the last five years is that we now think that the universe is composed not just of ordinary matter, but also of a more mysterious kind of energy called dark energy or vacuum energy. This energy is akin to the cosmological constant that Einstein first put forth. He put it forth originally to keep the universe from expanding in his theory. And then he realized that the universe was in fact expanding, so he took it back out. But if you put it in with the right sign, that same contribution can make the universe not only expand, but accelerate as it does so. And recent data show that the universe is, in fact, accelerating. So we have a consistent picture in this plane where we plot the fraction of ordinary matter here and the fraction of vacuum energy here. If you look at the microwave background, the WMAP picture I showed you earlier, it tells you that the universe is very flat so that the parameters have to lie along this line. If you look at the contents of galaxy clusters, you can basically see where all the real matter is, and you have to fall along this line. And if you measure how fast the universe is accelerating or expanding, which it happens to show acceleration, the data have to fall along this line. And you see there's a nice convergent point in the middle where all of our experiments give the same value. So there's a value of, um, whoops, there's a value of matter and vacuum energy that fits with all of the data. And that happens to be one in which 30% of the universe is in ordinary matter, and about 70% of the universe is in this very mysterious dark energy or vacuum energy. Oh, and this is just the pie chart that shows us um, those relative fractions. The ordinary matter is brought up, into, or the matter is broken up into two parts, the dark matter and then the baryons, which are the protons and neutrons. And the micro background is about one part in 10 to the four of the energy budget, which on this particular um, computer incarnation comes out as a zero, but it's not supposed to be zero, <laughs> it's 10 to the minus four. So we actually have a very good handle on the current inventory of our universe. And that leads, leads us to the fate of the universe. Classically, there are three fates that I just told you about. A critic, or a, an overdense universe is bound, it will expand from the Big Bang up to the present day, eventually turn around, and then recollapse on itself in a rather dramatic scenario called the Big Crunch. 
an open universe or an underdense universe shown by the blue curve here just expands forever and is unbound. And then there's the critical case in between, which is marginally bound, where the universe has exactly this critical density. It expands forever but slows down as it does so. Now we now think that because of this new component to the universe, that none of these curves are the actual answer, but rather the universe will start speeding up. It actually started to speed up just a little bit before the present epoch. And um, it will keep on speeding up, at least into the near future. Now what that means is that you can ask what happens to all the structures in the universe. The top panel shows a simulation which is tuned up to give you a picture of our universe today. Um, again, this would look better if it were darker, but we'll, we'll deal. And as the universe gets older, since the universe is accelerating, it's moving other structures out of our cosmological horizon. So if you wait about 92 billion years or so, um, every bound structure, like our local group of galaxies, for example, will be isolated. So if you were an astronomer looking out in the sky 100 billion years in the future, you would see Andromeda, and you see the large Magellanic Cloud. These are little smurfy dwarf galaxies near us. And that, was, that would be all you could see. You would not be able to see any of these beautiful pictures of external galaxies that I showed you a few slides ago. So it's actually kind of fortunate that we're doing um, astrophysics now rather than 100 billion years from now, <laughs> because it's a lot more fun. Now, let's zoom in and see what happens inside the galaxies, OK? We've accounted very roughly for the formation of the universe and the formation of galaxies. Let's go further in and see what we have. It turns out that in the middle of every galaxy, there's a supermassive black hole anchoring in its center. Supermassive here refers to a mass scale that goes from about millions to billions of times the mass of the sun. There's lots of indirect evidence, um, some done by Doug Richstone and his colleagues here in the astronomy department, which is actually in this building that's not this building. Um, and what they find is that to first approximation, every galaxy has one and only one of these supermassive black holes anchoring its center. And one of the interesting problems that um, astrophysicists face in the next decade is to provide an explanation for exactly how it is that these black holes got there. Unfortunately, we are still working on that. But we also know, <laughs> moving on, that every galaxy produces about a million stellar mass black holes. Now, these, we actually know how they got there. When the very most massive stars explode at the end of their lifetimes, it's possible for them to leave behind black holes of roughly stellar mass. And we're starting to understand that process. So the inventory of black holes, which is one of the things that a lot of people are interested in, the inventory of black holes in a galaxy like ours is about one big one and a million little ones where a big one means millions to billions, and a little one means one to 10 times the mass of the sun. But the real workhorse of galaxies are actually not the black holes. They're more of an interesting curiosity. Most of the energy that's generated by galaxies, in fact, most of the energy that's generated by anything in the universe today is actually generated by ordinary stars. So the electromagnetic radiation from stars is actually the power source for everything in the universe, and eventually, somehow, including life itself. So the next thing on our agenda is to account for how the stars got here. And this turns out to be a little bit, um, in some sense, easier and harder problem, because we can see stars forming today. Stars formed very early on in the history of the universe, but they keep forming. As long as there's raw hydrogen gas, you can make more stars. So we can look at the star formation process today. And that makes things easier in the sense that we can actually look at it and see how it works. It makes things harder in that we get a lot more detail. So there's a lot more detail to explain. So this is a picture, a famous picture of the Eagle Nebula, which is one of the more dramatic star forming regions where very, very massive stars have formed and they're blasting away the surfaces of the cloud. These big elephant trunk structures here are molecular cloud material that um, are being 
evaporated away by the very massive stars that formed within the cloud itself. A more, um, slightly more sedate, but still quite dramatic region is um, in the trapezium region in Orion, which you can actually see with binoculars if you look out in that one day out of 30 is clear enough for you to see this. Um. <laughs> but through looking at stars forming in a whole collection of nearby clouds, um, astrophysicists have um, outlined a basic paradigm for how stars form, which I can now step you through. We have these clouds, and we'll go from those beautiful pictures to this little schematic here, where um, if I zoom in onto the size scale of about one parsec, which is about three light years, you see that there are these little subcondensations. These subcondensations are um, supported by pressure, but they're dense enough that gravity is very important, and they're rotating very slowly. What happens is that the centers of these condensations collapse inward first, and they form a little core-like thing at the center. As that material falls into the core, the next outer layer of the, of the region doesn't have any pressure support. It's like you're standing on a floor and someone takes the floor out from under you. So what happens? You fall. So the next outer layer falls in. And then the next outer layer after that falls in. And then the next outer layer after that falls in. So this rarefaction wave propagates outward, leading more and more of these core regions to collapse. So you form a central little object, the thing that will be a star, and then you surround it with this inflow of material. Now, because the material is rotating, material with high angular momentum doesn't fall all the way in. It spirals in and forms a disk around it. So you, then you get this structure where you have the star, a disk that's forming around it. Material falls in on most of the solid angle, and then the star generates a wind along the poles. As this collapse develops further, the cloud is sampling material from further and further out in the cloud, which means more and more angular momentum, which means it can't fall as far in, and it's easier and easier to blow it out. All the while, the star is getting bigger, which means it's more powerful, which means it can generate a more powerful wind. And eventually, it will become powerful enough that it separates itself out from the background of the cloud, thereby forming the new star. So the cool thing about this is that the star actually plays an important role in determining its own mass. And then when you're done, you get a star with a circumstellar disk around it. Now we've worked on this um, paradigm, and we can match up what each one of these stages looks like in terms of what radiation comes out. And we can match those radiation spectra up with what we see in real clouds. And the picture hangs together pretty well. We still fight about the details at conferences. But the general paradigm of these stages is pretty well secure. And it's only been in the last decade and a half, really, that it's come to be. Before that, you couldn't see anything. And I should tell you the reason why. All of the radiation that comes out of this process comes out at infrared wavelengths, wavelengths that are longer than you can see. The first satellite that was able to measure anything relevant to this process flew in 1984. It was called the IRS satellite. So it's only since 1984 that we even had a window into this process. Now, the interesting thing that comes out of this is that you naturally form a star with a disk around it, this swirling nebula of material. It has a typical size up to from 10 to about 100 AU, where an AU is an astronomical unit, the distance of the sun from our Earth. Now, to give you a, a calibration point, the size of our solar system is kind of sort of about 30 AU, because that's the orbit of Neptune. So one of the interesting things that we found in the last 10, 15 years is that all stars form with these disks. And the mass in the disk is large enough to form solar systems. And the size of these disks is rel relatively comparable to the size of our own solar system. So the formation of planets, because planets form out of these nebulae, is relatively secure, or relatively um, common. So let's talk about stars for just a minute. Um, once you've formed the star, it will attain the right configuration to burn hydrogen. And then it will go through hydrogen burning cycles like our sun is now. Um, our sun is now here in this diagram called at the point A. What I'm showing here is a sequence of stars of different mass 
so that big stars are brighter and hotter, and small stars are colder and dimmer. The hotness or spectral class is plotted backwards in keeping with astronomical traditions. So a star of a given mass will attain a particular configuration so that it can be nicely burning hydrogen in equilibrium. And as such, it will, for a given mass, it will lie along this sequence. Now, as a star gets older, it turns out that it gets brighter. And it's pretty easy to understand why. The reason why is basically what you learned in freshman chemistry. Um, you have this star. It's providing its energy by having hydrogen burn into helium. So you're taking little things, hydrogen, and you're making them into bigger things, helium nuclei, right? Well, as you make things from going from little things to big things, the partial pressure of the helium is less than that of the hydrogen per unit mass. So as I make the star older, I lose pressure. To compensate for that pressure, I have to have more energy, which means the star has to get brighter. So every star gets brighter as it gets older. Now this um, effect is quite dramatic. In the next three and a half billion years, the sun will go from point A to point B in this diagram, which doesn't look all that dramatic, but it is kind of important because that's the point where life on Earth dies, okay? When the, Earth, when the sun is only about 40% brighter than it is now in three and a half billion years time, that's enough to run to um, drive a runaway greenhouse effect and basically sterilize the biosphere. So this is the real global warming problem. But it's not going <laughs> to, well, it's an even worse global warming problem, I should say. But this won't happen for about three and a half billion years. And in about seven billion years, the um, sun will come up to point C here, where it becomes a red giant, and it will engulf the Earth. But that's something I'm going to wait for the, less, uh, the um, final lecture to describe in greater detail. Now, one of the things that you've probably been told is that the sun is an ordinary star. Well, you've been lied to. Um, it turns out that if you look at the 50 nearest stars, and you plot them on the same diagram where I plot luminosity versus temperature, the sun is right there. It's actually the fourth largest star of the nearest 50. Now, for you students out there, if you take a class and you get the fourth highest grade in a class of 50, you'd be rather upset if the professor gave you a C. which is an average grade. So it's not really fair to say that the sun is an average star. To first approximation, every star is much smaller than the sun. Now the reason why that's not so obvious is that even though by number and even by mass, most of the stellar population lives in the small things, if you look out in the sky, the stars that you see are the bright ones, because you can see them much further away. So all the stars you see with the naked eye are in general bigger than the sun. And the ones that are bigger than the sun are in, at least for our story today, in some sense the most important ones, because they are the ones that give us the elements. Remember when we talked about the first three minutes of the universe's life, we were only able to produce hydrogen, helium, and lithium. Now this periodic table has tortured chemistry students for decades. And one of the things that we want to understand, at least as physicists, is how it is that we got all of these elements. So far, I've only accounted for the first three, which is a good start. <clears throat> it's actually an even better start than you think, because most of the universe is actually wrapped up in those three elements. Only one or two percent of the universe by mass is in the heavier elements. But those are all the fun ones that give us carbon and oxygen and life and things like that. So we might care about accounting for their existence. And here's, the, here's how it works. This is the nuclear landscape. <clears throat> what I'm plotting here is a mountain, which represents the binding energy per particle of nucleons as they get bound into nuclei. Now let me tell you what that means. If I take hydrogen and I go through the nuclear process that I out showed a picture of earlier, I can eventually get to a helium nucleus, which is down the mountain here. Now here's the cool thing. If you take four protons, or two protons and two neutrons, and weigh them, 
In other words, you determine their mass. And then you bind them into a helium nucleus, and you determine its mass, and you compare the two results. The helium nucleon, the nucleus has less mass. It's gone. Now the, and if I plot how much it's gone, it's akin to going down this mountain, because this is the energy, mass energy per particle. So when I go from hydrogen to helium, I make a big step down this mountain in terms of the amount of mass per particle. Well, where does that mass go? Well, that mass is converted to energy through this E equals mc squared equation you might have heard about. And that's what powers nuclear reactions. And that's what powers the sun, and that's what powers a nuclear bomb. It's the missing mass, or the mass that gets lost in the course of nuclear reactions. So when I make hydrogen into helium, I lose mass and I go down the hill, and I get energy out. If I burn hydrogen or helium into carbon and oxygen, I go down the hill further. And I can go all the way down to the valley of iron. <laughs> so what this tells us is that iron is the nucleus with the tightest binding energy, which simply means that it's the minimum energy configuration that's available to a nucleus. So if you waited long enough and you had a way to get there, basically everything wants to flow downhill. So all the nuclei want in their hearts to be iron nuclei. The only problem is how they get there, okay? So if you look around the universe, you see that iron is pretty abundant compared to other elements, but compared to hydrogen, it's only about 1%, right? So the reason why you don't have everything in the form of, of um, iron is the electric force. The strong force will win against the electric force once the particles become close enough together, but the trick is to get them close enough together. So the way you get them close enough together is in a star. So if you have a star like our sun, it burns its hydrogen into helium. Then what happens is that you run out of hydrogen in the, in the middle. The star collapses, and then the hydrogen begins to burn into carbon and oxygen. For a star like our sun, that's as far as it goes. But when you get to larger stars, the carbon and oxygen will burn into silicon and sulfur, and then eventually that collapses too, and the silicon and sulfur will burn all the way to iron. And you get this core of iron. Now if I go back to the previous picture, you see that as I go down this hill, once I get to iron, there ain't nowhere to go. Okay? You can squeeze iron all you want, and you won't get any more energy out of it. So once a star reaches this configuration where its core is made of iron, it's done producing energy through stellar means. And what happens is it collapses. And it collapses, rebounds, and explodes. And this is what a supernova explosion is. It's the death throes of the very most massive stars. Stars bigger than about eight times the mass of our sun will undergo these supernovae explosions upon their death. And you see, the, as I start with hydrogen and burn all the way to iron, I have these shells of different burning throughout the star, and once I have the explosion, I then scatter the remains throughout the universe. So that's a very nice and efficient mechanism to explain the production of elements from hydrogen all the way to iron. But if I go back one more slide, you see iron's only here. So I've gone a ways from the Big Bang, which gives me hydrogen and helium and lithium, all the way to iron through stars. But we still have the rest of this periodic table to account for. So how does that work? Well, if I look at this plot again, you see that when I take small things and I bash them together, I get energy out. But if I take large nuclei and I break them apart, I also get energy out. So if I can make iron, and I want to go from iron up to heavier nuclei, it's going to cost me some energy. Now, the way this works is that during these supernovae explosions, you have lots of energetic neutrons around. And what happens is that you have lots of the iron around. The iron will absorb neutrons, and then the neutrons will give off electrons through a weak interaction um, event. 
and turn one of the neutrons into a proton. And thereby, you've climbed up um, the um, periodic chart by one or two atomic numbers. Now, there's so many neutrons and so much energy in a supernova explosion that you can keep doing this. So, so with a combination of alpha particles and beta decays and so on, you can bootstrap your way from iron all the way up to uranium. Now, if you look at this chart, you see that having this happen one particle at a time, going all the way through this, don't worry, I won't explain all the steps. Um, <laughs> it takes a while. And what that tells you is that the elements beyond iron should be rare. And uranium in particular should be rare. And it is, in fact, rare. And it's probably a good thing that it's rare. <laughs> but this is how all of our elements came to be. Most of them are, most of them by mass, it was a production of helium in the Big Bang. Most of them that you care about were produced by the nuclear burning phases of massive stars. And then the rest of them were produced by the supernova explosion of massive stars. So just to give you an idea of what our solar population looks like, it turns out that about half of the stars aren't really stars. They're these stars that are like stars, but they don't have enough mass to do any nuclear processing. And these objects are called brown dwarfs. About half the stellar population are stars that are big enough to burn hydrogen, but not big enough to blow up. These are stars that live in the range from about um, 0 0.08 times the mass of the sun up until eight times the mass of the sun. Only a tiny fraction of the stars shown here as a slice, which is about to scale, only that tiny fraction are large enough in mass to blow up in these supernovae explosions that we talked about. By number, that's three or four out of a thousand stars are big enough to blow up. But it's these three out of, or four out of a thousand stars that produce many of the heavy elements that we're interested in. So we have this sort of karmic cycle of stellar evolution in our galaxy, wherein the clouds form stars. The stars turn into red giants. They put lots of their mass back into the interstellar medium. Some blow up. They leave behind degenerate remnants. And they produce um, metals, these heavy elements, everything heavier than hydrogen, for the interstellar medium. And these um, gaseous things collect in molecular clouds. And you go round and round in the cycle. So galaxies are always undergoing this process of, um, of evolution, wherein the metal content, the heavy element content, of the universe is slowly growing larger with time. Now this process of star formation and stellar evolution, this cycle of evolution, will continue as long as the galaxy sustains enough basic <coughs> raw material to keep the process going. And the, pro the raw material that keeps the process going is basically unburned hydrogen gas. So the, the galaxy will continue this stellar cycle that we're now in until it literally runs out of gas. Now, remember, the universe is now 13.7 billion years old. But 13.7 but billion years is relatively young. This stellar process, the stellar cycle that I described briefly, will continue until the universe is about 1,000 times older than it is now. So if you're worried about evolution of all kinds, we're only one-tenth of 1% 1 of the way into the main stellar phase of our universe's existence. So that means most of the stellar evolution, and perhaps biological evolution, that will ever take place in our universe lie in our future, not in our past. So our universe, in that sense, is very much um, just beginning. Now, I want to go on to the, the final size scale of interest. We've gone from the universe itself, to galaxies, to stars, to both their birth and death, and now we want to talk about planets. One of the more interesting things that's happened in the last decade is that we have finally, after two centuries of searching, we, as astrophysicists, have finally found planets around other stars. The very first such detection happened in 1995. And um, over the last decade, we have um, well over 100 now. Here's an intermediate plot where we show the orbits of the first 75 planets that were discovered. And what I'm plotting here is a histogram of their locations in the solar system. Um, and 1AU is where Earth lives. So 
these planets have a wide variety of um, distances from their stars, and they have a wide variety of eccentricity in their orbits. Now, one thing I should caution you about is that all the planets that we've found so far are large planets like Jupiter. They have a range of masses from about Saturn's mass up to about 10 times the mass of Jupiter. We're still in the process of looking for Earths. Don't be discouraged. Our sensitivity isn't big enough or great enough yet to find Earths, but it should be in about 10 years' time. So hang on there, and we'll hopefully have Earths for you in 10 years. But it's not a promise, um, but it is a goal. So the next question you want to ask is how it is that these planets came to be. So the planets form out of these circumstellar disks. I went through um, in some detail the story of how stars form. And I made the point that for every star, you always get this nebular solar system-sized disk of gas around it. Now, the way we think planets form is from the bottom up. These disks of material are primarily hydrogen and helium gas, but one or two percent of the mass is in the form of elements bigger than or heavier than that, and those are what we call metals. Most of those um, elements are in the form of little tiny dust grains, which are basically little specks of rock. Okay? They're mostly graphite and some silicate, so it's kind of like pencil lead and sand. I mean, to so you have this disk of material with pencil lead and sand sort of interspersed throughout it, and then some ices as well. They collect together. They're actually not little spheres like sand, but they're kind of more fluffy structures, and they stick together when they hit each other. And they slowly build up into bigger and bigger bodies. Now, the way Jupiter-like planets form is that these bigger bodies become very large rocks about the size of 10 times the mass of Earth or so. And once they approach that mass, their gravity is strong enough that they can eat gas from the surrounding nebula. And then they get really big really fast, like Jupiter. But if you don't cross that threshold, which is, depends exactly on the details, but it's about 10 times the mass of the Earth, then you stay small and you stay rocky. So if you look at our solar system, as you well know, there's four rocky planets in the inside and four gaseous giants on the outside. And all of the gaseous giants have cores that are of order 10, 15 Earth masses in them. So astronomers are now trying to um, develop this theory of planet formation in greater detail and apply it to this ever-growing collection of extrasolar planets that we're finding. And we're finding this whole host of alien worlds. Now the big question, as I outlined before, is that we want to identify how many solar systems are like ours in the sense of having what we call habitable worlds. Part of the problem with um, answering that question is we're not quite sure what defines a habitable world. The usual explanation is that you want a world in which there's liquid water on the surface. And if we, physical, you know, we human beings wanted to ever move to such a place, that's what you would need. But I think that if you ask a grander question about you know, where life might live in the universe, there are more possibilities. Um, there's this intrinsic difficulty, I think, in having a planet like our Earth. And it's one that we haven't completely um, resolved, but let me just define for you what the problem is. And the problem is that if you have Earth, it lives in the inner solar system where it's warm, right? So suppose you want to make an Earth. You need to make it in the inner solar system where it's warm so that later on when it has water, it will be warm enough for the water to be in liquid form. Fine. The problem is that under those conditions, the rocks that make the Earth don't have any ice on them. They don't have any water on them. So if you make a planet where it's warm enough to have liquid water on its surface later on, you don't get any water, <laughs> which is a problem, right? Now you get, so the question is how you get the water on there. Well, one way is to have comets, and that was the traditional way. But it turns out that comets aren't quite effective enough and we think in the case of Earth, um, it's not comets because the exact elemental isotopic abundance of comets is different from that of our oceans. So we don't think that our Earth actually got most of its water from comets, but rather um, rocks that contain ices and stuff in their interiors 
which are called hydrogenated rocks, might have come along with the comets and provided the water that we have on Earth. But it's kind of a dicey proposition that if you make a planet where Earth is, it's hard to get enough water on it to make it worth having the Earth there. Now, there's hope. It turns out that if you make Earth-like planets further out in the solar system, beyond um, basically where Mars is in our solar system, then it's cold. So the rocks, the raw material that make the planets, are coated with ices, all kinds of ices, including water ices. So you naturally get lots of ice on these bodies. Just as a proof of principle, if you look at the Galilean satellites, they're much smaller than Earth, of course, but they have um, typically 100 kilometer ice sheets on them. Our mean depth of our oceans for comparison is only about four kilometers. So if you form a rocky world out in the outer solar system, it's good because you get lots of water. The downside, of course, is that it's cold and it's frozen, so it's not on the, on the surface. And one of the things, we don't know that much about life, um, in spite of putting it in our book titles. Um, <laughs> but one of the things that we think is that you need is some kind of liquid water environment. So if you want to ask the question where life exists in the universe or in the galaxy, um, one of the questions you can ask that's related to that is where are the most common and likely liquid water environments. And until now, I think we've been prejudiced to looking at our own solar system and thinking that the most likely liquid water environments are on planets like ours where the liquid water is on the surface. But this argument I just went through tells you that most of the water is going to live on frozen planets. Now we have another bit of um, evidence. This is our tree of life. So hold that thought and I'll come back to it in a moment. Um, the tree of life has three branches. There's the eukarya. These are the um, kinds of life that you think about when really you think about life, because this is plants and animals and just about everything that you normally think about, including all complex life forms and mammals are on the tips of one of these branches. But in addition to this branch, there's bacteria, which you know about, and then there's the archaea, which are kind of sometimes called um, a different kind of bacteria. But these are the most um, extreme one-celled creatures that live in the geysers in Yellowstone and kilometers deep underground and in the hydrothermal vent communities. There's some that live deep in the um, vent communities under the ocean that thrive only on sulfur. And they're very, very different from monkeys and things up here. Now, we think that all three of these branches of life stemmed from a common ancestor, a last common ancestor, and that last common ancestor um, evolved quite a bit from the original life-giving birth moment, which we'll call biogenesis. In other words, there was some time when chemical reactions all of a sudden started being biological reactions. And I'm sorry to tell you I don't have a good answer for how that came to be. If I did, I would also be back in my office working on it. But um, we do know that it happened <laughs> and that this biogenesis event led to a last common ancestor which eventually branched into these three branches. Now the point I want to make here is that these archaea, the guys that live under the most extreme environments, often the deep underground environments, are the branch of this tree that are most like our last common ancestor, or at least that's what the current thinking is. So that argues that life very well may have originated deep underground under extreme conditions. And that's why the earth as a flower pot is shown here. Now going back to our icy worlds, let's pretend that I formed an Earth-like planet out in the outer solar system, where Jupiter is, let's say. Then I've argued earlier that the rocks that make the planet have lots of ices on them. I'm automatically going to get 100 kilometers of ice on the surface. Well, what you might not realize is that in addition to the, um, the energy that Earth gets from the sun, it has an internal power source. The radioactive elements inside the Earth provide the Earth with enough power. It's about 10,000 times less than we get from the sun, so usually we don't worry about it. But if you move the Earth out to where Jupiter is, that starts to matter. Now it turns out that that internal power source is enough to keep liquid water in a layer beneath an ice sheet. So if you form a planet in the outer solar system and it automatically has 100 um, kilometers of ice, then there'll be a liquid water ice sheet beneath 
um, where the ice sheet, liquid water beneath an ice sheet, where the ice sheet is 10 to 14 kilometers thick. So all you need is to have the ice layer deeper than about 14 kilometers, and you'll automatically have a liquid water environment. Putting all these pieces together, it argues that the most common liquid water environments in the galaxy are not on Earth-like planets where the water is on the surface, but rather they're on frozen planets, kind of the scaled up version of the Galilean satellites, where there's liquid water below an ice sheet. Now, if it then turns out that life did, in fact, originate deep underground, the origin of life doesn't care about whether there's an ice sheet or not. So if that were true, it would also argue that the most common place for life to exist in the galaxy would be on these frozen planets. It doesn't give you Star Trek, but it does give you where all the life um, is likely to um, exist. Um, so I'm probably running out of time, so let me just <clears throat> close with one final set of thoughts here. Um, if you add up all of these um, discussions that we talked about today, what you find is that everything, the formation of everything in the universe is driven by the same laws of physics, the four forces of nature we talked about, and how they interact through quantum mechanics and relativity and chaos theory. And one of the things that strikes you as you think about this is that our universe has the right version of the laws of physics so that life can emerge. I mean, that's kind of obvious because we're here. We have the laws of physics we have and we are here, so that makes sense. But you can ask a slightly more theoretical question and ask, well, suppose the laws of physics were a little different. Suppose the strong force were a little bit stronger or a little bit weaker and we'd have to rename it or something like that. <laughs> can you still get life? And that's a tough question to answer. Many uh, physicists have tried. And the general consensus is that you can't change the laws of physics all that much and get life as we know it. I emphasize the as we know it part because there could very well be many more possibilities that we don't understand or haven't thought about. But certainly the kind of carbon-based life forms that we are require laws of physics very much like the ones that we have. Of course, that's not a coincidence because we evolved in this particular set of um, conditions. But the question does remain, why? I mean, why is it that the laws of physics have the form that they do? And why is it that the laws of physics have the right form for life to develop? Now, again, we don't have a precise answer to that. But I thought a good way to end up is to go back to my unsatisfying um, earlier space-time manifold and give you a partial answer. One way to understand why it is that our laws of physics are the ones that they are is to envision that our universe is just one of many. So we talked at the beginning of this lecture how there was this original space-time. And out of that space-time, our universe was launched. Okay? So there's this region of space-time which represents our universe. And during that, and in this entire region, this whole universe was spawned by the first or the same birth event. The observable universe, the part we can see, of course, is only one small part of this larger universe. But the laws of physics within this whole larger universe have the, the form that we see and the strengths of the forces that we see and such. It's possible that in addition to our universe and our universe's birth event, other birth events could take place, like over here. And if that can happen, and we don't know that it does, then it's possible for the laws of physics in those other universes to be different. Now, if this picture is correct, and again, this is only an idea, if this picture is correct, what it means is that all of the universes in this big complex um, structure of universes will sample all of the different possibilities of laws of physics, whatever they are. So then, the fact that we live in a universe that allows for life to exist becomes sort of obvious, because of course we're going to be in the one that allows us to exist. But it's not that special that we live in one that allow us to exist, because there's all these other ones that we could have lived in, but we don't live in because they don't let us exist there, right? <laughs> so you see there's some work to go before this, um, this picture is complete. But um, one of the things that we're going to try to understand as physicists in the 21st century is why do the laws of physics take the form they do? And in particular, can you construct a self-consistent theory of physics in which you have different laws? Now, in order to do that, we have to complete 
our understanding of the laws that we do have. So we have to, the first step on that agenda is to understand quantum gravity. So maybe string theory and its descendants will provide the answer, and maybe something beyond that will provide the answer. But um, those are the questions that you know, we seek to answer in the next 100 years or so. And that's probably a good place to stop. Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the University of Michigan Department of Physics and by gifts from friends of the program. Local broadcast is made possible by Pfizer Incorporated.